In 1968, a large oil field was discovered on Alaska's North Slope. The oil companies considered building a pipeline to the port city Valdez, but this would be very costly. So they started investigating a shipping route to reach the American Eastern Seaboard. But this route had never been commercially used. They rebuilt an oil tanker to be able to withstand the harsh conditions of the north. If successful, the SS Manhattan would become the first commercial cargo ship to ever sail this route. In September, it started. They sailed down the Delaware River and headed north to Baffin Bay. The waters were calm, conditions were good, and they reached Tula Air Base in Greenland without any issues. But the real challenge started here. Upon entering the Arctic archipelago, they found themselves in one of the harshest conditions on Earth. It's cold, windy, and there aren't any adequate emergency services. But after several months of slow progress, they reached Alaska. This was a historic achievement, but it also started a dispute between Canada and the United States. This event brought the legal status of this water to the attention. Canada considers them to be internal waters, which means that they can regulate everything. Shipping, fishing, the environment, and much more. But the United States, amongst many other countries, dispute this and say that they are in fact international water, similar to the Taiwan Strait and the Turkish Straits. This trade route is now becoming increasingly relevant as the ice in the Arctic is melting. The summer of 2007 was the first ice-free summer in recorded history. Canada's new government has put the North higher on the domestic policy agenda than it has been for half a century. Canada's Prime Minister responded by announcing massive investments in infrastructure and shipping to secure their claim to the high Arctic. But the United States is determined to protect the freedom of navigation in the world's oceans. We're entering a new age of strategic engagement in the Arctic, complete with new threats to the Arctic and its real estate and to all of our interests in that region. We are potentially witnessing a revolution in global trade. This is Canada's key to global power with hindsight. You can't really understate the significance of the crossing of the SS Manhattan. People have tried to commercially navigate this passage for hundreds of years. It goes back all the way to the 1400s. Spices from East Asia were a valuable commodity in Europe. They were transported over land through dozens of middlemen that each got their cut. This made these spices ridiculously expensive. The alternative was to ship them over water. The route through South America and Africa were long and treacherous, with many ships wrecking midway. It was clear that whoever finds a shorter northern route would become unimaginably rich. Many countries tried and failed. The best and the most respected captains in the world were put to the task, but no one managed to find a safe route. Until 1903, when Roald Amundsen made his attempt he boarded this tiny little ship with five others, and in September that year, they left the harbor of Oslo. They sailed to Greenland, and their tactic was to hug the coastline as much as they could. They spent years in the high Arctic, often stuck in ice. It turned out to be an incredible advantage that they had such a small ship and crew. They learned from the local Inuit population about Arctic survival skills and they spent their time stuck in the ice and they searched for the North Magnetic Pole. After three long years, as seen in this picture, they reached Alaska. The expedition proved that the Northwest Passage existed, but it also demonstrated that it wasn't economically viable. When the Suez and the Panama Canal were constructed, the urgency to find a Northern Passage was lessened. A ship that travels from London to Tokyo through the Panama Canal travels about 23,000 kilometers. Going east through the Suez Canal is about 2,000 kilometers shorter. But a trip through the Northwest Passage would only be 1,600 kilometers and would save two weeks. But the unpredictability of the sea ice made it a pipe dream. 
The voyage of the SS Manhattan brought attention to the potential of this route, but it didn't prove its viability. That same ship tried again during the winter and failed, after which the oil companies decided to just build a pipeline instead. But a seed was planted. The event started much public debate, and the Canadian government responded by passing a law to regulate all shipping in zones up to 100 nautical miles of its Arctic coast. In other words, they made sure that the entire world knew that these were their internal waters. The United States was closely watching, and they responded with this statement, saying, We cannot accept the assertion of a Canadian claim that the Arctic waters are internal waters of Canada. Such acceptance would jeopardize the freedom of navigation essential to United States naval activities worldwide. The dispute was formalized. Canada and the United States have had amicable relations that withstood the individual agendas of political leaders. This dispute was a sore spot. For Canada, it mostly comes down to environmental concerns. They want to protect the fragile Arctic environment and the people that live here. They are mostly Inuit and they are very reliant on this water, ice and wildlife for their food supply. The United States is mostly concerned with achieving maximum freedom of navigation, not just here, but around the world. They fear that Canada's claim might set a precedent for other countries to do the same. For example, on the other side of the Arctic, there's another route, the Northeast Passage. This hugs the Russian coastline, and Russia is now rapidly militarizing the region. Russia is pushing rapidly into the region with aims to control it before anyone else. They're upgrading their Arctic military bases, expanding their naval weapon systems and their fleet. Like Canada, Russia claims that these are their internal waters. If the United States supports Canada in their claim, that could legitimize Russia's claim. And the US was already aware of this in the 1980s. The dispute was more or less settled back then, when Canada and the United States signed this Agreement on Arctic Cooperation. It's only one page long, and it resolved some of the practical issues without solving any of the sovereignty issues. Basically, they agreed to disagree. But Canada still stands firmly on its claim, and they have compelling arguments. The Inuit population that lives here has a long history with the ice and the water. This is their ancestral hunting ground. This is where they created cultures and generations of people. They are now Canadian citizens, and if they lose the sovereignty over this water, that would pose an existential threat to their traditional way of life and culture. Canada also has legal arguments. In the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, in Article 8, it sets the conditions for the establishment of a straight baseline, which has the effect of enclosing as internal waters. In other words, Canada believes that the geography of the archipelago places all this water within its territory. The United States didn't sign this agreement, but they cite another article that says, transit passage applies to straits which are used for international navigation. In simple terms, if the straits are used for international trade, they should be considered international water. And many vital choke points around the world are international water following this same logic. Take for example the Turkish Straits, which are just a narrow waterway through Turkey, but they are international water, as well as the Danube River, which connects landlocked countries such as Austria and Hungary to the ocean. This is also international water. Many of the world's most important choke points under international law do not belong to any one specific country. So why would Canada's? For the local population, the melting of the sea ice will undoubtedly change their way of life. If the passage becomes as lucrative as the Panama Canal, it would add $3 billion in annual revenue to the region. It would also allow passage of cruise ships. The tourism sector, which is almost non-existent today, could add a thriving new industry to the region. If all of this is correctly managed and we learned from our past, this could help indigenous communities take a more dominant position in Canadian society. If that's the goal, the first step is to grant locals sovereignty over the territory. And that discussion is now increasingly heating up. 
In 2013, the first commercial bulk carrier transited the Northwest Passage. On its route from Vancouver to Finland, it made a nearly 2,000 kilometer shortcut. This allowed for the ship to carry 15,000 tons more weight and it saved $80,000 in fuel. In 2016, the luxury cruise ship Crystal Serenity charged upwards of $22,000 per person to navigate the Northwest Passage. Canada is investing hundreds of millions in the construction of new airports, villages, roads, and ports. They're getting ready to defend their claim and to maximize their interest. But let's pause here for a reality check. How close are we actually to this becoming a regular trade route? The United States Department of Defense estimates that the passage will be nearly ice-free during the summers of 2040. But there will still be ice. The winds and the currents are constantly shifting this ice, making the route unpredictable and dangerous. This uncertainty will lead to higher insurance premiums, and at best, the passage will only be open during the summer months. It's likely that this will be a niche business for the foreseeable future. Today, about 20 to 30 ships transit the canal each year. Most of these are done by icebreakers and small adventure vessels. Commercial traffic hasn't increased at all. We're still far from this becoming a regular shipping route. But one thing is sure, as the earth is warming, it will become increasingly viable and relevant. One of the disputes that needs to be solved is in the Beaufort Sea. Canada and the United States don't have a clear maritime boundary, and the area is of interest to oil companies. Their border will also influence agreements on which country is responsible for search and rescue operations, which is currently unclear. And both countries are under-equipped for the task. Arguably, the most pressing issue for Canada is to cooperate on environmental issues, to protect the fragile Arctic ecosystem and the people that live along the passage and who depend on this water to sustain their traditional way of life. This is already under strain from the accelerated pace of warming. The relationship between Canada and the United States is long established and is based on trust and cooperation. It has historically withstood the changing political agendas in the electoral cycle. For this dispute to be resolved, that same trust and cooperation is needed for Canada to use its key to global power and to safeguard indigenous rights and for the United States to get favorable terms. Consider watching one of these two videos next.